I'm Amy, sex educator, sex and relationship coach, and co-owner of PurePleasureShop.com. I'm April, VP of the cutting-edge sex toy company Hot Octopus, and I dedicate my life to the business of sex. We are on a mission to teach you how to have hot sex, deep intimacy, and how to make your own rules for who you are as a sexual being. Welcome Welcome to to the the Shameless Sex Revolution. Want to learn more? Go to shamelesssex.com. And for 50% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use code SHAMELESSSEX at purepleasureshop.com. You are listening to a pleasure podcast. For more from our sex podcast collective, visit pleasurepodcasts.com. Well, hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Shameless Sex Podcast, your favorite podcast about sex. Woo! It's Tuesday when we're recording this. Oh, my God. No, it's not. It's Thursday. Oh, it's Thursday. But we're having a mega podcast day. Yeah, we are. It's mega. Like mega. Mega. Uber. Uber. With, yeah, not to be confused with micro. Super. Uh, guess what, everyone? This what? podcast. Guess what? Guess what? It's with Dr. Nicole Eisenbrown. We actually loved recording this podcast, which actually we love recording every single podcast but dr nicole uh blew our minds with a lot of the medical technology that is now available for specifically uh well actually no she was talking about vulva owners and penis owners in ways that you can enhance orgasm work with incontinence all the things bring more sensation especially with age but also even for folks with uh specific conditions that make it hard to orgasm because that exists of people you know folks of all ages and she talks about this from a perspective of coming from a surgical background in urology but now actually what does non-surgical work with people with something called like the O shot and the P shot. The fem, Femi? Femi wave, right? Femi wave. Femi wave is really interesting. We've I was like, I want all of them. Gaines wave before, but never Femi wave. So. And Gaines wave is for the penises. Yeah. And the Femi wave was for the vulvas. Mm-hmm. And so there's information about ways to work with erectile stuff, ways to work with, sorry, I'm moving my dog because he's being a jerk, ways to work with uh, orgasm issues um, without having to go and get surgery. And of course, there's other ways too. We use you know, sex toys. Toys, and there's lots of tools and tips that we have that don't even involve any sort of procedures. But guess what? There's procedures procedures available, and it's kind of awesome that we have this medical technology available. I know it's it's great to be a person in 2021. I want all the things. I do too. I what, what that was one of my questions. Which how do I get in. all the things? Yeah, <laughs> I was like, well, I just want to. I want. It's not that I want to anti age or uh, or prevent the inevitable, but I want to minimize the long term effects of. I want to keep my sex drive, and I want to minimize the. The, the things that could go um, south with my hormones and my yeah. vagina. I wanted to cooperate. Well, and she said in the podcast, she said that um, there's the idea that if we uh, practice early or exercise the things early, then later on our, it's the, what is it, muscle memory? Yep. Right, instead of waiting till we have a huge problem, that there's certain things that we can do that are preventative ahead of time. So, yeah, stay tuned because there's a lot of really interesting, insightful information. We love her and we will have her back. Um, Chip, guess what I did the other day? Uh, oh, I know, but I'll pretend I don't. I had a pelvic release session. Where I had pel- on my pelvic Didn't floor. Didn't you cry a bunch? Oh, yeah. I cried a ton. She was holding some things in her pelvic floor. Well, I was also going through some emotional stuff, but I went. And so April and I have done sexological body work sessions before. We've done podcast episodes about that. And I went into a session with Willow Brown. Dr. Willow Brown has been on our podcast multiple times. What, three times, I think, I love right? her. Yeah, she's fantastic. She's amazing. She does all the things, but she does a lot of Taoist sexology. She does, oh, God, acupuncture. Oh, I got the trifecta, too, that you did. Yeah, I did. Well, the, I Actually, not really the, call the trifecta. But. I did the trifecta because she she uses acupuncture and massage and cranial sacral, and cranial right? sacral yeah. all yeah. together in one session. Yeah, and that's not really working with the pelvic floor, but it is working with all the organs that also work with the genitals. Yes. From afar, like the kidneys, she the was adrenal glands. Doing something with my ears, oops, sticking my finger, and then I started salivating, and I was like, "I'm salivating a lot right now." And I was like swallowing, swallowing, and she was telling me that there's this interconnected bone that is in your ear that's connected to your um, sal- salivical gland. Salivical. There's another d- probably Over your saliva glands. Your saliva glands. Oh yeah, uh, and they're they're interconnected, and there's a lot of different combinations of things working together in your in your the bones in your ears with the rest of your with the rest of your head and everything's working all together yeah. well and I was talking to her about you know sex drive and genitals and things that she was saying your adrenal glands and your kidneys and your liver and all these things are they're all connected if something's depleted it can affect 
everything else and your sex drive um, or the performance or the sensation in your in your pussy and your bits so I had this experience in there one with a lot of different touch in there um, where she's just kind of holding different areas and a lot of tears coming out and then she was almost like hakomiing me like doing like deep therapy work um, but I'm bringing this up because um, like later that day and the next day and the next day after that I felt more of my sex drive more mm. of like that not like a full pussy throbbing but more aliveness more connection and it was and it was really profound it's like I needed the deep release to be able to feel more of that I want to do these every month although she's moving in November where's she so moving to I think she's moving to Europe you know Maui, Maui first and then Europe oh. yeah that's her plan if she can nice. so anyways if anyone wants to check them Mass out migration to California yeah well, she does in-person sessions in Santa Cruz. You can also go check her out online. She's an online sessions. It's yinwellness.com. She's amazing. Um, and you can do, go to her for pretty much all the things. What does she not do? She does everything. She I, does. I just want to talk about that because I like sharing when I do funny things in my pussy. Funny things meaning I let other people touch them for <laughs> healing. Which a lot of people don't do. It scares people. They're like, oh, God, is that okay? Yeah, so you just want a well-versed uh, practitioner. Oh, yeah. I'm not just going to let anyone in. <laughs> my dog almost threw up in April. What's going on? On here my dog is like on one today yeah. he's extra crazy i'm like amy you do not have a great podcasting dog she's no. like i know he's being extra difficult oh god oh, he's geez. crawling at me ah. oh my god what's going on over there oh jeez, now he's whining oh my god here comes your dog oh it's a shit show over here a full-on dog shit show okay so i'm gonna read a sex question before we do i'm also going to talk to you about our favorite lube in the whole wide world we've been fans for years uber lube april what's your favorite thing about uber lube go well my favorite thing is that i use it on everything <laughs> and i consider Consistently run out of it. I'm like, oh, another bottle gone? Yeah. Because I need to get the mega size bottle. Which is, yeah. The, yeah. I don't know how many the, milliliters it is, yeah. but it's uh, the massive. hundred milliliter. Because I always feel like I'm out of it. But I love, I love that it has no smell. It lasts for quite a long time until, but not like other silicone lubes where three days after I take a shower, <laughs> I Still there. do everything, scrub, soap, and water, and it doesn't come off. Uber lube lasts as, until you don't want it anymore and then with a shower or just like just cleansing wipe it will dissipate I actually like it on my body too I don't even feel like I need a shower I'm like I want to rub this all into my skin on my cuticles in, in your my hair. hair yeah has no flavor no scent she's got it's, some wild mane yeah, hair it's, it's some of the best lube it, to, in our expert opinion uh, we are huge fans and I recommend trying a bottle so you can join the fan club most people that have tried it they are they're, they're just never going to turn back uh, and guess what everyone you all get 10% off and free shipping in the United States uh, when you use code SHAMELESSSEX at uberlube.com. That's 10% off and free shipping when you try our favorite, favorite, favorite lube and it comes in a pretty glass bottle. You should code use code SHAMELESSSEX. Go check it out right now and you won't regret it. All right. You likely won't. I can't promise that, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure you won't. Okay. You ready for a sex question? Yeah. I've been with my partner for three years now. It started with a lot of sex, which is great because my libido is high. And I think this is a Volvo owner, everyone. We recently moved in together and our sex life has decreased. Every now and again, my partner will not be interested in sex and several, for several days to a week. During this time, I feel sad, unmotivated, unwanted, and not confident. I masturbate during this time, but it really doesn't do much for me. I fully know that it's not cool to pressure someone into having sex, so I can't put this on him. He has suggested that I find other people to have sex with, and they also said they have to try this. It doesn't work. It's not really for me. Another thing is that during this time, I think, well, maybe I'll just smoke a cigarette and I quit a year ago, but I don't. This makes me think I'm addicted to sex. Do you think this is true, or do I just need to get over it? Amy hates the term get over it. Get over so, it. So no, do not do that. I don't hate's a strong word. You do not I really uh, concur. I don't people think it's need helpful to get over it. To yeah. just say like, oh, just get over it. Just drop it. Your 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 needs don't matter. Your feelings, your sads. Yeah, certainly. I not. don't think that they are uh, I don't think they're sex. addicted to sex. No. It sounds like things do shift on the regular when you move in with a person because, and this is why you have to take some extra time to nurture the romance and the physical pleasure pieces in the relationship because you can become roommates and the logistics get in the way. 
or the comfortability of being home and wanting to just chill out and watch some, stream some movies. And so you have to really, if you really want time to speak to this and to time to be with your partner intimately and physically, you're going to have to talk to, to him. He's a penis owning human and let them know that, let him know that this is important for you. But I don't think you're addicted to sex. Well, it sounds like they have had conversations. The partner's like, well, just go sleep with other people. You know, they're trying the things. They tried the sleeping with other people or dating other people. It's not their jam. They try, they're trying masturbating. But what's happening is that you still feel some sort of void. You feel sad, unmotivated. And then the things that stick out is like the unwanted and not confident like it's something wrong with you and it, there's something in you that's taking it personal and it's like your, wi- your worthiness cup is not being filled and it's waiting for sex or affection from a partner or another person to fill that void does that make you an addict i don't really think so i think when we're talking about sex addiction or addiction in general and i'm not an expert in this but my understanding is that addiction is um, often something that's really affecting your life like it's getting in the way of things you can't drop it you it gets in the way of your work your relationships it's like all that you can do it's like there's another other energy or being or entity in your world. This reminds me, I just watched this movie, Barbara Streisand movie, about called A Mirror Has Two Faces. It's from like 96. Oh, Jeff yeah. Bridges is in it. And it's about how he's like this very attractive professor and he is just like, I don't know, crazy is the best way to put it when there's a, an attractive female around and sex gets in the way. So he hooks up with Barbara Streisand and they get married and they choose not to have sex because he says it's something that ruins his pathway to uh, the rest of his career expanding because oh. he gets in, in, so involved with it. And then whatever, at the end, her, her needs are she needs to have sex and not just be, you know, this professor. But it's true. And I was thinking about that. I'm like, sex is, in, it's a, for me, it's a, it's a barometer yeah. that indicates what's happening in my life with my partner. And when it's good, and I need it, I don't equate sex and love to be the same thing, but when it's good and my sex is going well, I feel like my relationship is, I feel more connected and more more connected to myself because it's so important. And I can masturbate the day away, but it's just not the same. I, I crave and need that that thing. I don't yeah. think I could be in like a platonic partnership without sex. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm curious for this person, if what would happen if you broaden the definition of sex? I do this with couples a lot when I work with them, is like, what is your partner's definition of sex? What's your definition? How can we broaden it so that if your partner's not really turned on or interested in sex for a couple days to a week, is, is what it says, what maybe it's not penetrative sex they're available for. Maybe be having their cock touch is not what they're available for, but can they use their mouth on you? Can they use their fingers on you? Can they, can they use a sex toy on you because you're the one that's turned on or interested? Um, can they watch you masturbate? You know, I think when people get stuck at sex in the idea that sex has to happen a certain way, it's really pressuring. If someone's not there, which I'm not always there, like for, you know, for penetrative sex or all types of sex, um, it, it can get in the way. So broaden that for both of you and then meet each other in the middle. Like, you know, you want it five days a week. They want it one day a week or two days a week. Meet in the middle and then broaden what that looks like um, and don't make it just like one way. Um, and I think also the other tip I would say is uh, you're not, I don't think you, there's anything wrong with you, but like go work on building your worthiness cup up, filling it up for yourself. I know you're trying masturbating and dating and all these other things um, and that's not working. It's not your jam, but what are some other ways you can do that to feel, you said, Unwant, you know, unwanted, not confident, unmotivated. So how can you feel wanted by yourself? How can you feel motivated? How can you feel confident without having someone else say, I want to fuck you to feel that way? You could just binge watch romance comedies. There you go. And uh, Friends, that's what I do. That's, does it make you feel <laughs> when I'm not getting wanted laid. and motivated? Like, you know what? <laughs> I bet that makes you really it, wanted. It makes me distracted and, yeah. and laugh and, and sort of look in my brain about what I'm seeking in a partnership. Ah, yeah. Are you uh, Chandler Bing? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I want a Chandler Bing when I grow up. No. Anyways, good luck to you. Um, you're not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. It sounds like there's just some work to do. There you go. Well, hey. that was a good sex question. Are you ready for Dr. Eisenbrown's bio? Yeah, yeah. Dr. Eisenbrown is a private practicing urologist who is board certified in both urology and female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. Her practice is dedicated and to restoring pelvic health and pleasure in women. Dr. Eisenbrown is a number one best-selling author of several books, including Sometimes I Laugh So Hard, The Tears Run Down My Legs, and Why Does Sex Hurt? To learn more, visit DrEisenbrown.com. That's D-R-E-I-S-E-N-B-R-O-W-N.com. But first... We know sex and pleasure are major factors when it comes to well-being, and there's even science to prove it. Orgasms have been shown to boost your mood, reduce stress, support your sleep quality, and even benefit your immune system. 
This is why we can't get enough of Foria. Foria creates intimacy products that fundamentally change the way vulva owners experience pleasure. Foria is like your pleasure godmother, here to remind you that your body can do amazing things and that you deserve to climax every time. My favorite Foria product is the Awaken Arousal Oil. It actually works with your body to enhance pleasure, ease discomfort, and help make great sex even better because it was designed to support sexual pleasure, solo or with a partner. And now you can have your own pleasure godmother too because Foria is offering a special deal for our listeners. Get 20% off your first order by visiting foriawellness.com slash shameless or use code shameless at checkout. That's F-O-R-I-A-W-E-L-L-N-E-S-S dot com forward slash shameless for 20% off your first order. I also recommend trying their intimacy suppositories with CBD because I love how they enhance my arousal. You'll thank me later. All right, it's showtime. All right, everyone. It is episode time, interview time, and we are here with Dr. Nicole Eisenbrown. We had some tech issues to get here. So just so you know, we're here. We made it happen. That's how much we love you, dear sweet listeners. We are here today to talk to Dr. Nicole Eisenbrown about all kinds of important conversations. Um, and she comes from a background of urology, working with people on erectile dysfunction, um, also with a lot of vulva owners. We realized a lot of our questions were geared towards uh, vulva owning humans, but we also are going to ask about erectile stuff because uh, we want to cover all our bases. And uh, that is a big question that we get from people in, from our listeners. We also are going to cover the question about uh, endometriosis that we received from a number of people. While this is not Nicole's specialty because she comes from a field of urology and more from a uh, pelvic floor healing and pain, uh, she will have a couple things to say on that too. But before we go into all this, Nicole, we always start with the same prompt, Dr. Nicole. Um, we, we ask our listeners to share a little bit more about your journey on how you got to the field of sexuality. And specifically, I was reading in your bio, why at 12 years old did you want to be either a nun or a heart surgeon? Hmm. <laughs> oh my goodness, you guys are awesome. I don't know where you found that, but um yeah, uh well, I always kind of wanted to be a teacher, but when I was in fourth grade, I was attending a Catholic school and we were living in Panama at the time. And I don't know, there must have been something the teacher said that day that was pretty inspiring. And so I came home and told my mother I decided what I was going to do. I was either going to be a heart surgeon or a nun. And she looked at me and said, well, I'd rather you not be a nun. And so, <laughs> but for those of you Catholics out there, don't worry, she's still a very, uh, a, a very devoted Catholic, but um, she grew up in the time where they beat your knuckles with uh, rulers. So that's what she thought. But anyway, I uh, evolved not to do either uh, at, at that point. Um, in fact, when I was in eighth grade, I came home and told my parents I had no idea what I was going to major in in college and I was going to panic about it and of course they're looking at me like you're in eighth grade why are you even thinking about this so um, I ended up majoring in business in college for one reason um, I didn't know what I wanted to do but I wanted to go into something that I thought would expose me to some things which would spark an interest well nothing sparked an interest so I graduated with a business degree and uh, went into sales and I was working with Pfizer um, in Jacksonville, Florida, as a pharmaceutical rep. And um, I was uh, shadowing one of my physicians who was a pulmonologist. And I had a very unique uh, situation. We uh, took one of his last patients of the day into his office, and I had no idea what was going to happen, but um, he ended up telling her that she had lung cancer. And uh, her ears heard that for the first time. And she, as you can imagine, went through every emotion that you could imagine under the sun. Um, and it was really quite devastating for her. But but I also got to watch how my friend kind of walked her through that process. And when she left that office, she um, had a sense of hope. And um, I knew I would never be motivated by a quota or a new drug that was going to come out or a promotion in the business world again. And I decided that day I wanted to go to medical school. I had no idea how. Um, I didn't even know what was involved. At that time, I thought pre-med was a four-year degree, uh, which it's not. There's just some prerequisites you have to do. Um, I was 26 years old. I had one chemistry class. So this was not... Um, what would most people would consider a really bright decision as a 26 year old, but um, I did all my research and figured out it was going to take me 11 years. And so I embarked on my 11 year plan and 11 years later, I was a practicing urologist. 
Wow, that's it. 11 years? Wow, no big <laughs> well, deal. I justified it as saying, well, I'm going to be 40 one day anyway. I might as well be 40 and a doctor instead of 40 saying, uh, gee, I wish you'd at least tried. So mm-hmm. that's yeah. the, that's kind of the short answer of a long journey. That's mm-hmm. great. And urology is, it's an incredible field. And I think we, I, for those folks out there who don't know a lot about urology, uh, as well as female pelvic floor medicine, and I know that you have some other specializations that you told us about before we started recording, but can you talk about the field of urology, female pelvic floor medicine, uh, also reconstructive surgery, I guess, what does this entail? And I know there's a lot of different questions layered on there, but why is this field so important? Okay. Well, I think all fields of medicine are important because every part of the body is important. But I think the first thing I want to share with people is how I got into urology, because that always sort of mystifies people. I only have one kidney. So, um, and all the females in my family are urology patients. So most people think of urology as a male specialty. I didn't grow up thinking that. So it didn't seem odd to me to be interested in urology. So when I was doing my rotations in medical school, Um, I thought I wanted to be an OBGYN. And then I decided that I really liked surgery and my experience was really great in in my surgical rotations and urology was just a natural fit for me because it was personal. So I went into urology and it's kind of interesting. um, My favorite procedure when I was a urologist was a penile prosthesis. So when I finished my training, I thought I was going to be the guru of erectile dysfunction in the panhandle because I practiced in Panama City for 16 years. But I got to Panama City and I was the only female urologist in over 300 miles. So very quickly, all of my patients became females and they don't have penises. So I can't really... uh, do anything with that. So uh, that's when I decided that I would embrace what God was giving me and I would take care of women. And so that's when I got board certified in female public medicine and reconstructive surgery. Um, And through that, I did a lot of prolapse, a lot of incontinence and associated with that, all the sexual health issues that women have. So I've been treating both men and women for sexual issues for um, two decades now. And so my oh. guess is this is really common for that people with something that people are dealing with, with, uh, with, with pelvic floor issues, with both penis owners, vulva owners, and all the in-betweens. Oh, absolutely. And it's far more common than people know, because most people don't talk about the issues, especially men. Women, I think, are a little bit more adept to share information with each other about what they do sexually, whether or not they're having sex, whether they're having pain with sex. But men don't discuss it with each other at all. And they're not very comfortable talking about it with the doctor either. Mm-hmm. And that's a big problem. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I I know that um, there's a lot of doctors that maybe have their own stuff around talking about sexuality that might show up to, and not just doctors, but even therapists and a lot of professions where they have their own biases or discomfort in talking about sexuality. So while they might ask, you know, some the questions that are part of the protocol and um, the invitation to go into the deep dive about what's really happening in the bedroom um, or outside the bedroom, but just sexually or with the anatomy of the body uh, might uh, not be their, well, their we've, forte. We've had other doctors that have practiced various forms of medicine on the show that have mentioned that a lot of Western training and, and, and becoming a Mm -hmm. doctor entails nothing that has to do with pleasure Mm. really. Right. So sex is a piece, but it's not pleasure, which is quite interesting function. It's function. Right. Which, but pleasure is a piece of all of those, uh, the, the jigsaw puzzle that you put together. I just wanted, because that was for me, my brain never calculated that that wouldn't be a piece of, of studying medicine Mm -hmm. in, in, in terms of it's such a huge piece of most people's lives. So yeah, um, no, you're absolutely correct. I mean, uh, you know, I trained on the urology side and although we, we trained in fertility and we trained in the function of the penis, we didn't talk about the relationship issues. We didn't talk about, you know, libido and how all of this stuff works together. Um, and my gynecology colleagues didn't get that training either. I got all of my sort of training in this field by doing, uh, trainings after residency. I'm a member of ISHWISH, which is the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. And I've done the sexual health, uh, courses at the AUA, which taught me things that I never learned in residency. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And so I'm, I'm curious in your expert opinion, we'll talk about the Volvo owners right now, why you think that, what are the main reasons why a lot of Volvo owners are experiencing painful sex and maybe coming to you or other pelvic floor specialists or other urologists, you know, what are the main reasons that are coming up that you're seeing? Well, there's a, there's a lot of reasons women can have pain with intercourse and, um, kind of drilling down on exactly what their symptoms are, uh, it can help figure it out. For example, the most common uh, cause of pain with intercourse is uh, vulvodynia, um, actually hormonally mediated vestibulodynia. And most gynecologists don't even know how to treat that. They they, they just wanna throw a lubricant at you. Um, And and that's really a shame because there's a lot of women that have that problem and it's a super easy thing to fix. Um, You can just use a a, a compounded, estrogen and testosterone cream on these glands that are in the vestibule. And most, in most cases, within two weeks, the pain goes away. Um, That's the most common, but there's lots of others. Lack of lubrication from vaginal dryness is one. When when you lose estrogen, two two things happen to the female vagina uh, as we age. They either get bigger or they get smaller. And it kind of depends on whether you're sexually active or not and whether you have estrogen. So older women who are not sexually active, who don't have estrogen, their vagina shrivels up and becomes very small. And then they try to have intercourse it's too small and it's too stiff. So it it won't stretch very well. Um, So that's a completely different problem than the woman who's had several children, she's sexually active, and then her vagina just becomes bigger and it's not as tight and snug around the penis. So that causes a completely different sexual problem. Um, So kind of knowing what's going on. Endometriosis, you mentioned that, you know, know, two thirds of women who have endometriosis experience some sort of sexual difficulty. And the most common uh, difficulty is pain with intercourse. Uh, We believe that, as I said, I'm not an endometrius expert, endometriosis expert in terms of treating it, but I've certainly been on the physician side of of dealing with a woman who has pain with intercourse with endometriosis. Um, We believe that it has something to do with the implants that might be on the backside of the vagina. And so that when you have intercourse, that tissue it's already irritated is being stretched and manipulated and is painful. It also tends to be worse during menstrual cycles because it's hormonally sensitive tissue. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, so some women do better between their cycles and not don't have as much pain, but then some women have pain all of the time. So treating the endometriosis, of course, is key. And wait, so uh, just to be clear, endometriosis, Mm -hmm. does it have to do with the uterine lining? Is that what it is? Well, endometriosis is the uterine lining tissue that is escaped into the peritoneal cavity, is implanted and grows there. So it's hormonally sensitive tissue. So it responds to the hormonal shifts in a woman, just like the uterine lining. Now, the uterine lining will shed and goes out the proper pathways. But if you have implants and tissue that, that's not used to having tissue that grows, wants to shed and bleed, that can cause some, um, you know, a lot of discomfort. And then the vulvodynia, which is, you said, one of the most common things that occurs in, well, in- vestibulodynia specifically. There's some, okay. Yeah. The, you know, I love learning th- about this stuff. Yeah. I'm like, yes, <laughs> teach me doctor. Well, you know, there's there's three embryologic origins of the female genitalia, um, which is 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 actually really important because um, they come from different germ layers, so they have different uh, needs. You know, if you go from outside to in, you've got the vulva, which is the mons pubis, the labia majora. Um, it comes from ectoderm. Ectoderm is where all your skin comes from. So it has very similar characteristics to skin. It's got hair. It's a dry surface. It has sweat glands. Uh, it does not secrete. A, uh, it's not, you know, doesn't have a, um, a secretion to it. It is not hormonally sensitive. Then if you separate the labia majora and then the labia minora, you can see a very distinct line change in the color of the tissue. It goes from flesh colored to sometimes even red. And people will think that means it's infected. It's, it's not. It's That's called heart's line. And that's where the vulva meets the vestibule. The vestibule goes from heart's line to one centimeter inside of the vagina uh, past the the remnant of the hymen. And that comes from the urogenital sinus, which is where the urethra and the bladder come from. If you look at a netter, which is the book that we 
we learn our anatomy from in medical school and nurses and uh, any medical professional is familiar with netter. If you look at the female development of the urinary tract compared to the male uh, development, the vestibule is analogous to the prostatic urethra. And the reason that's important is both sexes have remnant structures from the other one. And the, the vestibular glands are a remnant structure from the male parts. So those vestibular glands need testosterone, which is the, the, the part. So the vestibule needs estrogen and testosterone where the vulva needs no hormones. And then the vagina needs estrogen and only estrogen. And it comes from mesoderm. So you have three different embryologic origins, which is the reason you have three different sets of problems and three different sets of needs. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. And can you remind me vulvodynia and vestibule? I already forgot. Vulvodynia. Vestibulodynia. Is this, is this the tightening of that constant? Cl- no, that's or that's, the, or the loose that's vaginismus. Oh, no, wait. what happened? Well, that's vaginismus is the muscle. We're quizzing ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> what happens yeah. with, well, the way I learned it was hormonally mediated vestibulodynia. And what happens is, is because you have these vestibular glands that are right sort of around the opening of the vagina that need hormones. When you lose your estrogen and you also lose your testosterone, we don't think that much about the importance of testosterone in women. We don't know now that it's very important in libido, but it's also very important in the health of the vestibule. So if you have these glands that don't have testosterone, testosterone and they need it, they become unhealthy. Hmm. If a gland is unhealthy, then it can't clear itself of secretions and bacteria and things like that. So think of it as like a, you know, infected pimple. Mm. So now you push on that either with a speculum. Most women who have that will find speculum exams very painful. And then you put a penis in there, which is squishing this already tender, um, um, gland, it's a painful thing. Hmm. So one of the clues that I always used when I would talk to a patient who said she had pain with intercourse, I want to know where does she have the pain? Is it with entry to the vagina or is it like with deep thrusting? Hmm. Because some women have pain deep in the vagina and that can be from hysterectomy scar or a foreshortened vagina or, you know, um, lack of estrogen. So the vagina is not elastic enough, et cetera. Um, But if it's right on entry, almost always it's those vestibular glands. And it's a super easy thing to test because you can, you can see them. They're right, they're right at uh, one, three, um, five, seven, nine, and 11 o'clock right Mm -hmm. around the entry. And you just take a Q-tip and touch it and the woman will climb to the ceiling. This podcast was made possible by Satisfyer. One of the best ways to spice things up in the bedroom is by adding some sort of newness. New sex positions, new and exciting sexual activities, maybe a new sexual partner or two, and our favorite option, new pleasure devices. Satisfier makes turning up the heat easy with a variety of O-tastic vibrators and air pulse stimulators fully equipped with cutting edge technology. Their new line of products is Bluetooth enabled and pairs with the Satisfier Connect app. So you can connect your device to your Android, Apple, and iWatch, and you won't break the bank along the way. I recently tried Satisfier's dual pleasure and orgasm after orgasm later, I'm a fan for life. It's like two toys in one with options for vibrating internal pleasure or an air pulse clitoral stimulator. Vulva owners, you are seriously missing out if you haven't tried Satisfier's air pulse technology. And right now, Satisfier is offering our lucky listeners 30% off any Satisfier when you go to Satisfier.com and enter code SHAMELESSSEX30 at checkout. Again, if you're looking for one of our favorite new devices, go to S-A-T-I-S-F-Y-E-R.com and use code SHAMELESSSEX30 for 30% off. This podcast was also made possible by OMGS.com. OMGS is a research-based online program that teaches you all about how to pleasure the pussy. OMGS studied thousands of vulva owners to find out how they orgasm and then made beautiful animated modules and super honest short videos to give you ways to reach even more pleasure. I've been recommending OMGS to my clients for years and it's been changing their lives. We all know pleasure is fluid and ever-changing, so why not add more tools to your pleasure tool belt? 
OMGS is for everyone. So whether you are a vulva owner or you just love vulvas, OMGS will give you the techniques to get your O face on. There are two seasons to choose from and hundreds of gorgeous videos to explore. So go see what science says about pleasure and visit omgs.com slash shameless. That's omgs.com slash shameless to get $5 off your OMGS access. Again, omgs.com slash shameless. Go check it out. Now back to the show. Interesting. Uh, interesting because so I've done um, sex. Let me make this about me. Sexological body work sessions, and so it was April where we were clients where someone was doing some hands on pelvic floor healing, and um, and, and for me, our dogs are having a dog fight. For me, um, I uh, have dis- discovered that there's these parts right around the uh, the entrance, like the first I don't know half an inch of the labia at actually pretty much those spots um and Mm -hmm. specifically at the six o'clock spot but also like five o'clock seven o'clock and everyone if you're wondering about the clock if you're looking at the top of a vulva we're saying two three o'clock four o'clock rock hey (laughs) the top of the vaginal opening or like you know clitoris and urethra that whole part would be 12 and then you're moving your way down where the bottom will be six o'clock um and uh so, so you're saying that a lot of this is related to hormones, but also how does trauma come into play here too? Like people having experiences not, and I don't, I don't have severe trauma. I've had mm-hmm. a lot of compliant sex in my day where I, you know, I wasn't feeling a big yes, but I, but I still went with it. And, um, do you see that as part of it too, that people have had experiences that have just really hurt this part of their body and made it so that they feel pain there? Yeah. Well, a lot of people, it, people who have had physical traumas, especially sexual trauma can be very challenging to treat because it's multi-dimensional. It's, it's physical, it's emotional, it's psychological, um, but they definitely have a physical component to it. Um, you know, a lot of it tends to be a hypertonic pelvic floor and muscle spasticity, you know, so then, you know, the second they anticipate that they're going to be entered, even if it's with a person that they love and, and respect and feel comfortable with, they can't help but tighten those muscles in anticipation. It's kind of a learned response. Um, and it makes it very, very hot. And that can be very painful. Um, I treat a lot of, uh, and it's kind of related to this, like interstitial cystitis or people who have chronic pelvic pain in general, not just with intercourse. And one of the things that that I learned in my research when I was studying all of that is that many of those women tend to have a chronically hypertonic pelvic floor. And if you increase a, uh, the tension in a muscle by 10%, you decrease the blood flow through that muscle by 50%. Mm. So just think of a muscle that's chronically over contracted. Now you don't have the blood flow growing through it. So you're going to build up lactic acid, um, and all, cause blood flow is the key to everything and healing. It, it's, it helps to wash out, you know, the toxins, it brings the oxygen and, and all of that. So anybody who has, chronically over tightened muscles is going to have, it's going to catapult a snowball into multiple problems, which could be pain with intercourse or even just pain in general. Mm-hmm. So that's pain great- with urination, pain with defecation, all of that. Yeah. And that's, I think a great leading or segue, if you will, to this question, because obviously seeing a doctor and getting the care of a doctor, if you're experiencing mm-hmm. uh, this chronic painful sex, uh, but are there some solutions that maybe are things that people can do at home or a more holistic solution that you can suggest our listeners? They really love tips. So if you have anything you can share um, with us, that will be fantastic. Absolutely. There's, there's lots of things that we can do and the things that we can do are, are constantly being developed. So, um, for example, if you have someone that, um, has chronically, tense pelvic floor with whatever the manifestation of it is. Uh, Physical therapy can be very helpful. And there are physical therapists that specialize that. Um, And and they use uh, uh, special muscle relaxants and massage to kind of relax that. Uh, You can use vibrators to do that. You have to, you do it very gently and you do it in not (laughs) sexual play time because you have to, well, because sexual play has other things. You want to be relaxing. Um, I had, you know, hot baths and things like that can always help the kinds of things that I can do to help. um, We, one of the things that's really kind of new and exciting is Femi wave, which is kind of the girl's side of gains wave, which is low intensity shockwave therapy. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that or 
or not. I've they heard know a little about it, but not a lot. Yeah, yeah. Gaines wave yeah. we, we have, we've talked about before, but yeah. yeah. They use yeah, that well, more for erectile stuff for Gaines wave. So this is more, but this is for blood it, flow then. But it can be used for women. Well, I mean, just to talk about low intensity shockwave therapy in general, you know, as a urologist, we've used shockwave therapy for decades at high intensities, it'll break up a kidney stone. Mm. But at low intensities, it stimulates healing. It's used in wound healing. It's used in tendonitis. It's used in a lot of musculoskeletal disorders. Um, I've used it for several years to treat erectile dysfunction. And one of the one of the primary things that low intensity shockwave therapy does is that stimulates neoangiogenesis, which is new blood vessels. Um, it uh, stimulates stem cells to proliferate and differentiate. It basically, and it also creates a low grade inflammatory response, which is the way the body heals things is through inflammation. So there's no reason it shouldn't also work in women. And so we've been studying it in women and we're finding that it uh, reduces incontinence in women, which is huge because more and more women want to do things naturally without surgery. You know, I mean, as a urologist, I've operated on thousands of women, but women don't necessarily want to do surgery if they can avoid it. And now if there's options that you can avoid surgery, they, they want to choose that. So um, it helps with incontinence. It also helps with overactive bladder. We're finding it helps with people who have um, uh, vulvodynia or uh, vestibular um, uh, dyspareunia. Uh, and we think that that actually might be working on two different levels. One, because it's improving blood flow and blood flow brings oxygenation, washes away, you know, lactic acid and, and it helps the body to heal. But we also think that it modulates nerves because a lot of these women who have pain with intercourse have abnormal sort of nerve function, and maybe the nerves are sending too many or too few signals. Um, and so we think it's kind of modulating the, the pain receptors and that is down regulating their is it sense of pain internally or externally or both it's actually externally so we oh. there's there's six areas that we we target because the 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 path, the vibration penetrates several centimeters into the tissue. So you don't actually have to put it into the vagina. You do the labia majora, you do the perineum, and we, we do, you know, sort of the crew of the, the clitoris. And that, that helps the tissue all the way in the vagina to improve blood flow, um, improve the, the health of it, decrease pain, improve continence. And it also seems to help with bladder function. We, we found that, um, I was looking at some studies earlier today that show that the bladder capacity increases, which means you can go longer between urination. So people will have frequency. It can help them. Uh, it helps people go to the bathroom less frequently at night, less urgently, just kind of more control. So can it be preventative if you aren't having painful sex or anything that is related to endometriosis or vulvodynia or, or, bladder, uh, control. or bladder control? Can you do these things preventatively? I'm like, or is it I'm like do I need to see? Because I mean, yeah. that's that's a huge. I'm obviously like, do I need it now? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's exactly. Like I'm not having. I a I personally say yes. Okay. And the analogy I'm going to give is more on the men's side since I have some experience with that. Like for example, with the erectile dysfunction. I will have young men in their like 30s and 40s who are functional. They don't have erectile dysfunction. They just don't function as well or as with the stamina or the firmness that they did when they were 20. So they want that back and they come in and they get it back pretty quickly. And I believe that they will end up maintaining better, longer term health of their erections because they're maintaining it and starting early taking care of things. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, you know, if you've gone to the gym five days a week from the time you were 20 till you're 60, mm -hmm. As We're opposed to <laughs> starting at 55, yeah, yeah. you know, you compare those two 60 year olds, the one who's been taking care of himself his whole life is going to be in far better shape, better condition, better health than That's the person who picked it up later. Yeah. I'm so I'm curious like about this. Was it fem wave? Fem, what fem it's wave? called femi wave. Femi, femi wave. wave. Okay. So is this something that someone goes into a clinic to do? Is it something you do one time? You do once a month? Can you I buy, have, the you buy it at do home? It you do it <laughs> does insurance cover it? What are we talking about? Amy, help me <laughs> okay, out. Well, help the, wave. the bad news, insurance doesn't cover anything Not that is uh, yeah. worthwhile. Yeah. They don't cover a lot of more natural things, unfortunately. And I'd love to say that that'll probably change, but they're about making money. So uh, it's unlikely, but um, right now it would be something you'd go to a practitioner for um, probably, you know, someone like myself or anybody who does gains wave uh, will most likely also offer Femi wave. Um, there is a home device 
uh, that we use for men. Um, so at some point, uh, that's probably going to be useful for women. It's called the Phoenix Pro. Um, and you can buy that through anybody that uh, offers the Gaines Wave or, or Femi Wave. Um, but right now, um, women respond pretty quickly, even in as, as little as four to eight treatments. Um, you know, so coming in and having somebody who knows what they're doing and knowing exactly where to put it and how many shocks. And, you know, there is a little bit of some science behind the settings on the machine mm -hmm. so that we get the good results. Plus, I can also um, see what else might, you know, I don't, don't want to treat it in a vacuum. A woman may also need that that compounded cream to help with the vestibular glands. Or she may, for example, if I have an older woman who wants to become sexually active and hasn't been for a while, and she has a tight introitus that's a little stiff because she doesn't have estrogen, she may need some estrogen and then use some uh, self-dilating water. I don't know if you guys ever heard of cool water cones. Mm -hmm. You can get them uh, on the internet. They're wonderful for people who have scar tissue mm -hmm. or need to stretch tissue. Um, because they're self uh, lubricating with with water and you, they're very soft and um, and they're only like forty five dollars on like huh. Amazon. I don't know. If it's Amazon like a dilator kind of almost. But yeah, they're, they're called cool water cones and okay. they come in three different ones. They have different lengths and they're graduated in size. So okay. so for someone who maybe has a foreshortened vagina from an overly aggressive hysterectomy and they're they have pain deep because the vagina is too short for the penis. They can slowly stretch that. Oh. Of course, you need to do it not with sex because yeah. that's, you know, it would be painful. You just do it very gently, but you need estrogen to or soften the, the mucosa so that for yeah. the elasticity or for a woman whose introitus is too tight, the same thing. She can slowly dilate that so that she can accommodate a penis without pain. Is the compound cream testosterone that you're saying? It's got both estrogen okay. and testosterone okay. in it. So okay. I'm, I'm not trying to turn this into me at all. I just have a question because I'm <laughs> Let's turn it into you. Yeah, no. That's the, I the just, benefits of the job. But there's, and there's a lot of <laughs> listeners out there that are around my age and I'm 39. I just turned 39. And so I, I've Happy noticed birthday. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I noticed subtle changes with my, with my body, of course, but, uh, in terms of my vagina and in, it, it's like sex sometimes is more painful. And so I guess my question is, getting your hormones tested. I mean, is it yearly or, cause I've had my hormones tested. We worked with, um, uh, a fertility company that, um, shameless sex, um, worked with to test our, mm -hmm. all of our hormones and our levels. And, uh, and, and I was pretty healthy, but can that shift? I mean, I'm a virtually healthy person. I want to make sure I maintain my sex drive. Um, I know that's definitely not all the time. Sometimes I just don't want to have sex, but like are, as a woman that isn't, uh, um, uh, men premenopausal or uh, postmenopausal or going through menopause, am, am I a person that should go on a regular basis to get my hormone levels checked so I can maintain and make sure that my sex life is healthy? I'm not having painful sex, but I want to yeah. be preventative. No, I would. I would. And, uh, you know, our hormones start to decline starting at the age of 35, even Damn if we're still menstruating. <laughs> and the other thing that, that people don't realize, for example, with libido specifically, you know, anyone who's been on the birth control pill, which is a ton of women, um, their sex hormone binding globulin protein goes up and sex hormone and binding globulin is the protein that binds your estrogen and testosterone. I kind of think of it as like roving storage. So let's say you have X amount of testosterone, about 10% of that is bound to the sex hormone binding globulin, let's say. But if your sex hormone binding globulin goes up, then a higher percentage of your testosterone is bound, which means that's less of it available to tissue. Mm -hmm. So I treated a lot of women who, technically their total testosterone might be in the normal range, but their free testosterone was not mm -hmm. because of the sex hormone binding globulin. And they would experience low test, uh, low libido mm -hmm. and maybe vestibular pain. So I would put those women on testosterone, even if they were still having menstrual cycles. The other thing is there is a difference between technically normal levels and ideal levels. So, you know, the range that the lab tells you doesn't necessarily mean that that's normal for you. So uh, as far as hormones go, I recommend people see a hormone specialist as opposed to just their primary care doctor or, um, you know, a gynecologist who doesn't specialize in, in, in hormones specifically, because those subtleties, um, 
are complicated. And people who are hormone specialists have researched that they're going to courses, they're learning the interaction between all of these hormones, thyroid function, you know, it's not just estrogen and testosterone in their total levels. Mm -hmm. You know, you, it's, it's a much more complicated picture than that. So, I mean, I personally would recommend you find a, you know, hormone specialist and get everything checked every year, you think annually. Well, start out, you know, see where you are right now. I mean, I go to a hormone specialist and he checks my levels um, every four months. Okay. Yeah, I did a, I, I've identified as someone since I can't even remember was since I was like, you know, my late teens was the, probably the last time I, I experienced constant, spontaneous sex drive and libido. And then in my, uh, probably actually before, probably when around the age of 19 or 20, that kind of went out the door and it will come in like teeny little waves. And you weren't on birth control. I was at birth control from 16 to uh, 20 okay. or maybe 21, but then I've never been on any hormonal birth. birth well, that's not true. I have had a little stint with the Marina. Um, anyways, but I but spontaneous sex drive and libido has been something I've been pretty disconnected from. And it's not that I don't feel desire or spontaneous sex drive. It's really rare to just be like, I'm really horny right now. I'm really turned on. Oh, there's my pussy. It's just pulsating. Oh, look, I just, for some reason, just watching the show and now I'm turned on. It's something I have to really put a lot of effort into creating and, both like 99% of the time. And, um, and I have done hormonal tests and panels. My testosterone did come a little bit on the lower side, but nothing that my, um, I was working with the naturopath, nothing that she was like, Oh, this is really unusual, but we should still let's try testosterone cream. And I think I only did it for a little bit, but I think that's really interesting. What you're saying is that mm-hmm. you can get this general thing for your hormones, but there's so much more to it mm-hmm. than just looking at that one number for the level. Um, and that this is why we have specialists in so many fields, such as what you you do or what a hormone right. specialist does or what we do in the sexuality field, you know, we're helping a lot of people that are going to traditional therapists, but they can't talk to them about their sex lives. And mm-hmm. so I think that I want to really advocate for that for people and also probably for myself to go uh, seek out more specialists who have de- dedicated hours, years, plenty of energy and time into specializing in this one area or multiple areas in this field of sexuality that they've chosen. Yeah. Um, and then Speaking to you wrote you wrote and we actually this is in your bio, but you have a number of books. But one is sometimes I laugh so hard the tears run down my legs. <laughs> Love that title, not for the people that are going through that. She's talking about incontinence. Yeah, incontinence, everyone. everyone. But um, and I just to cover that really quickly uh, is this, this. So you were talking about the the femi wave as being something that can work with that. Um, and I know a lot of folks experience that whether they um have had you know reoccurring bladder infections that cause damage or or they also have given birth or there's a lot of reasons why. Or also, I've heard also like they're probably floor is just too tight and it's mm-hmm. constantly pressing on the, on the um, bladder. But if you'd like to maybe elaborate a little more on, you know, why that is, and then what you're seeing in terms of um, what's helping with that. With, with stress incontinence or just incontinence in general? Uh, I'm both or yeah, both? just people that okay. I guess what you're seeing most of in your office. Okay. Well, um, there's two primary types of incontinence. There, there's more than this, but the vast majority of your listeners are going to experience either stress incontinence urge incontinence or both. And to be honest with you, the most common scenario is for people to have both. Mm. Stress incontinence is leaking with activity, like a cough, laugh, sneeze, aerobics, jumping jacks, something like that. It would never happen while you're sitting there watching TV because it's an external pressure on the bladder. Now, urge incontinence is just the opposite. It has nothing to do with what you're doing, but what the bladder is doing. So, you know, remember the bladder is a muscle that knows how to empty itself without you. I mean, if, if anyone out there has a baby, they know that you don't have to tickle a baby or pinch its toes to get it to pee. The bladder just fills and empties all by itself. We learn to control that natural reflex. But sometimes as we get older, and primarily because the pelvic floor weakens, and as the pelvic floor weakens, we lose the ability to control that natural reflex. So urge incontinence is an unwanted leakage that has nothing to do with your movement. It just happens. So we call it urge incontinence because most of the time there's a sense of urge that happens before it. But a lot of women will say, I didn't even get any warning. It Mm. just came. And it can be a little bit of a squirt or a big squirt. Um, stress incontinence on the other hand is directly proportional to the force. So a little sneeze will result in a little leak where vomiting might cause you to just, Mm. you know, totally pee your pants because it's proportional to the pressure. 
Um, but most women have have both. Um, and it just depends on what you have as to what we do to fix it. When I was in private practice, which I've retired from that now, and I, I so I don't do any surgeries anymore. I try and do everything sort of naturally and, and use the body's own healing powers, so to speak, you know, use things like Femi Wave and uh, the O shot and P shot and uh, PRP and, uh, you know, muscle stimulators and, and, and things like that. But, you know, the kinds of things that you can use for stress incontinence is muscle floor strengthening. Uh, Femi wave can help. Um, PRP, uh, the O shot's very helpful for stress incontinence. Mm -hmm. Now, for the other end of the spectrum, overactive bladder, you got to calm the bladder down. So, avoiding caffeine is a big thing. Um, you know, there's triggers, and and people are their own worst enemy. I'm a caffeine addict, so I admit I self abuse by doing that. But if you have an overactive bladder, caffeine is not your friend. Mm -hmm. um, Kegel exercises can also help with overactive bladder. And the reason for that, it, not only does it strengthen the pelvic floor, but you're systematically telling the bladder to calm down. Because every time you squeeze your sphincter, you send a signal to your spinal cord that sends another signal to the bladder telling the bladder to relax. We all know that's true from being in a, you know, in a car, you gotta go to the bathroom and there's not an exit nearby, right? You really gotta go. So you kind of squeeze to make sure you don't have an accident. And all of a sudden that sensation goes away. Now it's gonna come back, you still have to urinate, but that, so if you do Kegel exercises and you do them religiously, every time you squeeze your sphincter, you're sending a relaxing signal to the bladder. So that's how Kegel exercises can help with both stress and urge. Mm -hmm. Stress by strengthening the pelvic floor, urge by sending relaxing signals to the bladder. Oh, interesting. So I'm what, learning so much. I know this is yeah. awesome. But can you talk about this O shot and the P spot? Because P when shot, I think of P an shot. O, shot, o, o shot, shot. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about the O shot? I think of like, oh, like I'm getting an O face from getting an O shot. Uh, and yeah, then well. the P shot as well. I said the P spot, but I did mean P shot. Um, how, how do these work and uh, who, who can get these? Uh, well, anybody could get them. Oh, um, <laughs> I personally have had four O shots and I can tell you they're amazing. Um, it uses PRP, which is platelet rich plasma therapy. Oh. Um, it PRP is used uh, most commonly in joints. Uh, you know, uh, I used Kobe to donate Bryant. plasma to, when I donated plasma in college for money back in the day. Uh -huh. Is that what is that what people would use it? Except for? that there's a there's a there's a special technique that you use to actually isolate the platelet part oh. of the plasma. I was like, the yes, my we... my plasma <laughs> gave someone an orgasm. Maybe <laughs> no, not quite. Probably, All right, but, sorry. All right, sorry. Um, <laughs> but anyway, the reason we want the platelets, it's platelets carry 21 different growth factors, and it's the growth factors that are signals to the body that tell it the area needs to heal. So for example, a platelet's job in life is just to circulate around looking for injury. And when it finds injury, it releases those growth factors. Those growth factors then signal the stem cells and the, the fibroblasts and everything, you know, that uh, st stimulates the body to do everything that it needs to do to heal. So the idea behind PRP is if you take the high concentration of those growth factors, inject it into whatever tissue is you want to heal, you amplify that process. So the O shot, what we do is we take your own blood, actually for the O shot or the P shot, we take your own blood, we spin it out in an FDA approved machine for PRP so that we get six to nine times the concentration of platelets. Um, and then we inject it to whatever tissues we wanna heal. For the O shot, we take, we spin it down to a five cc's. We take four cc's of it and inject it in the anterior vaginal wall, which is right where the G region is. Um, that sort of helps with vaginal sensation, but also helps with stress incontinence because it will stimulate collagen production there. Mm -hmm. And then we take one CC and inject it at the, the base of the clitoris, which enhances orgasm. Um, for men, we inject, we spin it down to nine CCs and we inject it into the penis and enhances um, uh, erections. Mm -hmm. So it works very, very well. Um, my first like ozone is it's like a similar because the ozone's <laughs> uh, like of, stirring yeah. in the little thing, but it's different. Ozone therapy. Yeah. No, yeah. no. Yeah. Okay. It, okay. It, o stands for orgasm shot. Yeah. And that's right. the yeah. P shot <laughs> actually stands for priapus, which is the uh, Greek word for penis. But oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I love this. I love doctors on our show. I yeah. learned so much, especially urologists. I want to do all these things. I want to do it too. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, there's no time like right now. I like want to, where are you located? Can I come see? <laughs> I'm you? in uh, Orlando. <laughs> Oh, my office Wait, is John, Dr. C, Dr. John, do you know Dr. Dr. C? He's another urologist on our show. What is John? Um, he's in Orlando, isn't he? John, Dr. C. he's in, 
he's in he's Florida. in Florida. Jacksonville, maybe. What's, his, what's his last name? Cal Car Car It's we call him Dr. Cack now. Which is Dr. C. <laughs> We're yeah. like Dr. C. We'll look him up and we'll find out. We think he's somewhere in your area. I but... think he is in Orlando. But so um, when you Oh, I, I will say, reach out to him if I don't, because we'll obviously yeah. we think alike and yes. have the same philosophy on uh, treating patients. So yeah, uh, Carazella. Love to meet him if I don't, oh, John, John Carazella. 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 Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was okay. on our show and he was super. Oh, Tampa. Fun. Tampa. Uh, oh. well, that's not too far, but yeah. maybe you can maybe you can uh, yeah. uh, make a connection. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll introduce you. And and so for people to work with you, you're all the way in Orlando. Do you, is it all in person? Do you work with people online? If they want to go do things like the OSHA and, you know, can they work with you and then find a clinic or how does this all work? Well, for any of the treatments, obviously you have to be here physically. Uh, the good news is Orlando is a place that a lot of people fly to. So that's helpful. I've done virtual consults. I have a couple of clients in California and a, um, a client uh, a couple of clients out in Las Vegas. Now I can't treat them per se, but um, I can do a consultation, do their blood work, make recommendations. Then, you know, they even hook them up with somebody that does Gaines wave or P shot or O shot or Femi wave, you know, in their area. Okay. Okay. Nice. Good to know. And uh, how do people find you if they are in your area and want to work with you? Okay. Well, I think the easiest way is I have two websites. Uh, my primary one is uh, amoremedicalspa.com that covers sort of all the services that we have. And then I have one that's floridagainswave.com, which is specifically catered to men and the treatments that I do for erectile dysfunction. But both of them have a way to email us, uh, our phone number, a uh, way to get a hold of us pretty easily. And you can even just Google me, um, you know, Dr. I like, I, you're Googleable. You're very Google. Dr. Nicole Eisenbrown, thank yes, you so, so much. I learned oh, my so much. I adore you guys are awesome. Information like this because we, uh, didn't, we, we didn't just make this about us the whole time. No. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, it's it's relative yeah. to a lot of folks out there that maybe didn't understand, like, oh, I'm in my mid-30s. Maybe this is something I should should approach or, or think about or or uh, or at least have a consult with a doctor that can help them and guide them, like such as yourself. Or, and the fact that you're available via the interweb is wonderful. So we'll have Dr. Eisenbrown's links on our website, but thank you, Nicole. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Oh, Nicole. my pleasure. Thank you. And thank wow. you for what you guys do. You're amazing. Oh. I really appreciate oh, it. Thank, thank you. you for what you do and all of the beautiful uh, scientific uh, nomenclatures that we learned today. <laughs> yeah, I'm so smart now. Uh, to all of you out there in the land of the shameless sex revolution, we love you and we love wine. Uh, if you didn't know that by now, then you probably don't listen to the end of the podcast. But guess what? It's the end of the podcast. This is just one shout out to our wine sponsor. We drink wine. Yes, we do. Sometimes we take breaks, but it's good for your heart, right, Dr. Eisenbrown? <laughs> She's shaking her head. Yes, She's I like, promise. Yep, I'm in moderation. <laughs> So go check out marginswine.com because it's very boutique wine, limited releases, only a couple a year, sometimes a few. But if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll be in the know. It's reasonably priced wine too, and it tastes beautiful. So go check it out, marginswine.com. You can also save money if you want to buy three or more bottles. Shameless Sex 10 is the code to enter at checkout. If you want to buy six or more bottles, it's Shameless Sex 15. Nailed that. Nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> that was really fast. And I want to do one more invitation. If you love Shameless Sex and love our guests, such as Dr. Nicole Eisenbrown and all the other folks that have been out there sharing their knowledge and expertise, please go and rate us on iTunes, y'all. It only helps more people find Shameless Sex and all of these practitioners, authors, experts that are out there sharing their wisdom with the world. We appreciate it. We read every single one. Five stars is preferred. Tell us how you feel. We love you. We'll see you next Tuesday. Ciao for now. Want to learn more? Go to shamelesssex.com. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use code shamelesssex at purepleasureshop.com.